All right, everybody, we are going to go just a little bit more in depth on slope than what we've done this last video. This should be relatively short, but I want to make sure that everybody remembers when we talked about slope last time, we said it was y sub 2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, or you might see delta y over delta x, where delta means the change in um, y over the change in x, and in that case, it is directional, so positives and negatives have meaning. Or you might have been told before slope is rise over run, where we use this little, this variable m to represent slope for all of our equation stuff. So rise over run, so that's the background on slope. We actually also did um, slope of a horizontal line. And we know, found out that m equals zero on those. And we also did slope on a vertical line. And we found out that that was undefined slope because basically we can't drive our Jeep up the side, straight up the cliff, right? We can go on a horizontal line, we can go flat forever, right? So our slope is zero, we're not going up, we're not going down, but we cannot drive our vehicle straight up the side of the vertical cliff or whatever. So we can't do that, it's undefined slope. So with that in mind, um, we wanna talk just a tiny bit about a different relationship, which is parallel lines and perpendicular lines. So I'll do parallel lines first. I think whenever I talk to people, most lines or most people know that these are lines that never touch. So a picture of this looks something like this. They're running side by side forever. And we'll put this little chevron on each of them to say that they have the same slope. Okay, so they are tilted in the same manner, even if my picture is not perfect. But lines that never touch have the same slope. Okay, so that's the first little bit that we're going to talk to and talk about. So if this is line one and this is line two, then this has M1 and this has M2, so slope one and slope two, they are the same, okay? M1 equals M2, they are the same, okay? So that's the first little relationship we're gonna dive into today. And the second one is on perpendicular lines. And again, some of you may have seen this before, but just as a reminder, hopefully we recall. Perpendicular lines are lines that meet at 90 degree angles, okay, or a right angle, right? You might remember it as a right angle, okay. Um, have opposite inverses for slopes. Okay, and they have opposite inverses for slopes. So what that means is if this is line one going this way, and he has M1 for his slope, and these two lines meet at 90 degree angles, so something like that, and this little square here reminds me that that's a right angle, and if this is line two with M2, okay, then whatever sign the first slope has, this would be a positive slope, right? Because it's going up and to the right. The second slope will have the negative, so opposite signs. Okay, so first thing is opposite signs. If this was the first slope, it would be a negative, which means that its perpendicular line would have a positive slope, right? So it, it's either way. If it's a negative, you want a positive for the inverse or for the opposite inverse. If it's a positive, you want a negative, okay? And then the second one is we're going to flip the M, okay? And sometimes this is a little bit easier to see than others, so we'll see 
an example of this. Okay, so what this means is M1 is equal to negative 1 over M2, or you could write it the other way. M2 is negative of 1 over M1, whichever way, it doesn't matter. So they are negative reciprocals or opposite inverses. Sometimes you hear it called negative, oops, sorry, reciprocals. I don't care how you think about that because they're equivalent statements, but that's how that's going to look, right? Okay. All right. So let's see what we're talking about here. This is kind of the background information. Hopefully you kind of remember parallel and perpendicular lines, but we need to see an example or two so that we can apply it. So here we go. Um, this looks like this example says, um, write the equation of the line. Of the line that is parallel two y equals three x minus five. Okay, so this is the line we're parallel to. That means we're going to focus in on the m there, and hopefully it will tell us something. So it's parallel to that guy, and it goes through the point one, negative three. Okay, write the equation of the line that's parallel to this particular equation, and it goes through this other. All right, Let's see how this looks. Need a little more space, sorry. Okay, so if we know they're parallel from up here at the top, remember lines that are never touch have the same slope. So whatever my M1 is, in this case, my M1 is a three. That's my slope here. That's the same as my M2. So my second slope, my equation for my second line is going to have M equals three also, right? So they are the same slopes. Okay, so that's the first piece that I need. Okay, And then the second piece that I need is in order to write an equation of a line, remember we're gonna use um, the point slope form, so we'll get that in a second, but we are going to have to utilize the fact that this goes through, the line we want goes through the point one, negative three. So I say go ahead and write your point slope form, form of a line. It is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Okay, and I know I need this one because I've got the pieces I'm putting in, right? So my M, that looks like that, M. My M here, I've got it. I want the second equation. So I know I'm gonna put in M equals three, okay? And then it says use this point. Well, I've got it, right? Here's my x1 value and here's my y1 value. So I've got that point right there. So I'm going to use that to try to come up with this equation. Okay, so what's it say? y minus, instead of y1, I'm going to put in this guy, which was a negative 3. Okay, there's a minus from the formula, right? And there's a minus or a negative sign from the three. So be careful with your signage here because that's going to be a minus, a negative, and we know a negative and a negative is going to give me a positive, right? So be really careful as you plug things into this formula. Okay. M, the slope that I'm using is parallel to the first line. It is a three. M is three. And then in parentheses, I've got X minus, and I need X one. Well, we said that's just a one. I'm going to plug that guy in there as well, okay? So I know that I'm ready to figure this guy out whenever I've got it like this because I only have the y and the x left, and I can solve for the y and get my equation, right? So that's the hope uh, that I'll be able to. So y, I said a minus and a negative is going to give me plus 3, is equal to 3 times x minus 1. That's just the way it is. I don't have to distribute um, any negatives or weird stuff like that. I am going to distribute this three through. 
If you wanted to do that in one step, you could have. So I've got y plus 3 is equal to 3 times x is 3x, and 3 times negative 1 is minus 3. Okay, and then the last step, I need to get this y completely by itself. So I'm going to, I've got a plus 3, I'm going to minus 3 on both sides of the equation. That gets the y by itself over here. y equals 3x, and I've got a minus 3, and I subtracted a 3, so that's a minus 6. All right, there's the new lines equation. That's what I'm after. Because the problem said, write the equation of the line that's parallel to that and goes through that point, okay? If it asked me for the slope, well, the slope is the three. And if it asked me for the y-intercept, well, that's the negative six, right? So I can put that into a coordinated point and talk about that, but we can pull those, those pieces of information out of it. It didn't ask me for that. It asked me to write the equation. So I've done that. And I hope that makes sense to everybody. If you have questions about it, let me know. All right. So that's what happens with a parallel line, a set of parallel lines. So let's keep going because we also need to talk about what happens with perpendicular, right? So the example for this is write the equation. of the line that is perpendicular is perpendicular to y equals 3x minus 5. And it goes through that same point. OK, so we've got one that's parallel to this set of lines, and it's going through the point one, negative three, and we've got another line that we're looking for now that's perpendicular to that original function, original equation, and it's going through this point. So we need two things. We need to know the slope and the y-intercept. I can find the slope because this equation, m1 equals three, right? But remember with perpendicular slopes, let me find it, I'm sorry. Lost it. There's my page, <laughs> okay. With perpendicular lines, their slopes are opposite signs and we flip the M. So opposite inverses, or some people call them negative reciprocals. So I'm gonna take that original slope, M equals three. I'm gonna take the opposite sign, so it's a positive, so I'm going to make it a negative, and I'm going to flip it. Well, right here, it's technically 3 over 1, right? We don't normally write the divided by 1 part, but that's what it is. So when I flip it, this 3 flipped over, its inverse or reciprocal is a 1 third. So my slope for my second line here is m equals negative 1 third. That's the opposite inverse or negative reciprocal. So there's kind of the big step there is to make sure I get the correct slope for my new line based on this piece of information right here, perpendicular. That's what I'm after. All right. Now the rest of this is going to look a lot like what we just did. We're just going to use um, the slope is negative one third instead of the other. So y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Remember, that's my point slope form. Okay. If you do this right, then by the time we take the test, you will have memorized that this is your point slope form, and it's probably a matching or something on that test. I usually put the formulas there, but you have to recognize it to be able to use it. So if you write it a bunch of times, then you'll probably remember it. Okay. So y minus, let's plug things in, y minus, this was my x1 and this was my y1. So it's still, this is a negative 3 for the y1. So I'm still going to put in y minus from the formula and negative 3 from the point. 
equals, and now I got to be careful because I'm dealing with the perpendicular slope, right? So this guy is the one I'm putting in. So negative one third, and I'm actually going to put parentheses on that to keep the negative, excuse me, with the fraction so that it's all together. And then X minus, and what was my X one? Positive one, right? Okay, so make sure you can pick out the pieces of information you're after here and use it appropriately. So just like the last time, this is just a matter of plugging it in. Once I've got it plugged in, I should be able to simplify. A negative and a negative is a positive three. But I'm going to have to be careful about this guy because I need to distribute that negative one third and the negative goes with it. So carefully, here we go. Negative one third times X is negative one third X. And negative one third times a negative one is a plus one third times one is one third. Okay, so it's a little bit not as nice here because I've got these fractions in here, but we can deal with it. Okay, the next step is still the same. I need to get this Y completely by itself. I'm adding three. I wanna get rid of that. So I subtract three from both sides. It'll go away over here and leave the Y by itself. So that's good. This negative one third X just comes down because he's the only X, so there's nothing to combine him with. But then I need to do this math, so be really careful. If you are struggling with this, go off to the side and say, hang on a second. I've got one third and I'm subtracting three. To get a common denominator would be to make three over one. So that would be nine over three, right? So one third minus nine thirds is negative eight thirds or rearrange that back into a mixed number, negative two and two thirds, okay? So if you need to do that, go off to the side, deal with your numbers and say, hey, that's a minus two and two thirds. You could use decimals here, but two thirds is in a pretty decimal. So I like to keep it as the fraction or the mixed number in this case, all right? Okay, so those are the parallel and the perpendiculars, and that kind of gives you an idea of what's going on um, in general now for this, this, this section of material. Now for us, what we're gonna do is eventually, depending on where you're headed for your classes, you're gonna sooner or later talk about either secant lines or tangent lines. Okay. So secant lines or tangent lines. So for a secant line, let's say I've got a nice pretty parabola here on both of these, okay? If I've got a secant line that goes, let's say it looks like that, then what a secant line does is it cuts through whatever curve I'm dealing with here, it's a parabola. It cuts through it in two different spots. So it hits here and it hits here, okay? And so the idea is that if I advance toward calculus, which some of you are probably headed that way, then eventually I can take a secant line and I can lessen the distance in between these two points. There's another secant line, right? And so the idea being that I can use the slope of the line to approximate the, quote, slope on the curve. Now, the problem with that is we know, hopefully, that whenever I'm looking at a curve, there's actually not a slope on this curve, right? It actually curves. Slope is the distance between two points on a straight line. But I can use the slope on the line to approximate what in the world is going on on the curve. That's the hope, okay? So the idea being eventually, if I come out here and I just hit the curve in one place instead of two places, I will get a tangent line, okay? Tangent lines only touch the curve in one place. Now, hopefully I can keep on bringing it out until I have the line here and I'll have this pretty little tangent line. And that idea is what's going to lead us into some calculus. So 
and there's something called a limit and you would figure it out if you head that direction. We're not gonna go that far. So for our purposes, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna talk about the average rate of change. Average rate of change. And in Webster world, I like to abbreviate that average rate of change or AROC. If you were in my calculus class, we would do instant rate of change, which would be IROC, okay? The average rate of change goes with secant lines, because I'm gonna have two different points here. The instant rate of change, which we don't need in this class, will go with the tangent line. So if you see that later, you go, oh, instant rate of change. It's because it's instant because there's only one point here. It's average because I've got two different points here, so I'm going to kind of average that slope out, basically. All right, so average rate of change. What in the world's going on? All right, we have this formula already. Slope equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? Okay, so what we're going to have here for um, average rate of change is we're just gonna say, hey, what if I had two different points and I plugged them into a functional value, all right? So instead of y's and x's, I'm gonna still have x's, but I'll have f of x2 minus f of x1. Now, hang on a minute. Let me finish this out. Divide by x2 minus x1. Isn't this the functional value of the x from the second equation? Isn't that just y2? Yeah, it is. So if it is a function, it's actually going to work similarly as if we had, hey, this is the functional value when I put in x1. Well, that's your y1, right? The difference being that the functions I'm putting into aren't necessarily lines, okay? So I'm going to find these, for instance, two points, they're on the secant line, but they're also on that curve, right? So I'm gonna find those two points. I'm gonna figure out what's going on on the secant line, and I'm gonna use that to approximate the curve, okay? I hope that kind of makes sense. If it doesn't quite make sense, it's okay. All you have to think is, hey, this is just like slope, <laughs> okay? You're just gonna have to figure out what is f of x2, that's the same as y2. So it's still a plugging in kind of process. All right, so let me show you how that looks with um, one of these parabolas. I'm going to scoot it up. And we will do one little example, and then you can play with the homework and see how it goes. All right, so the example is, well, what if we just had this lovely function f of x equals x squared, which is the parabola that I just showed, right? So I'm trying to keep it um, pretty straightforward, okay? So what it'll say is something like, find the average rate of change, I'm gonna abbreviate that, on f of x between x1 equals negative two and x2 equals zero. Okay, f1 equals negative two and x2 equals zero. Well, so if I'm using this formula, it's telling me, hey, I need to find the functional value of the x2. I need to find the functional value of the x1. So let's do that. F of x1 equals, well, we're going to put in a negative 2, right? That was my x1. And we're going to put it, that into the function, which was just, hey, take that guy and square it. Well, what is negative 2 squared or negative 2 times negative 2 it's a positive four, Dr. Webster. That's right. Okay, and then do the same thing with your x2. Okay, well, what was my x2? My x2 is zero. Okay, so we're going to plug in zero, and what are we going to do with it? We're going to stick it into this function. So f of zero is zero squared, right? And what's zero squared? Zero times zero or zero. Okay. Okay. So we've actually got these values. We, now we just need to plug them into the formula, right? So we go back and we say, hey, what was my formula? It's up here. I'm just going to rewrite it. Average rate of change is f of x2 
minus f of x1 divided by x2 minus x1. Okay, so the f of x2, guy, be careful that we plug it in the right order. Okay, that's the only thing you got to really watch out for is the order does make a difference. Okay, f of x2, that was the zero guy. There's a minus in the formula, right? f of x1, that was up here. That's the four. Plug him in, divide by the x2. We'll find it up here. x2 was zero. Minus, because there's a minus in the formula. What was my x1? My x1 was negative 2. Go back and find it. Be careful, because the x1 is negative, and there's a minus in the formula. So that's going to be a negative and a negative, right? Okay. 0 minus 4? Negative 4. And on the bottom, 0 minus a negative 2 is positive. So 0 plus 2 is Two, negative four divided by two is negative two. All right. So what we're saying is at these two points, let's see what this looks like. Let me give you a little parabola. Okay. Between X one, which was negative two, it's over here. And X two, which was zero right here. The slope of the secant line between those two points on this parabola is negative two. So interpret the slope of the secant line at these points is m equals negative two. All right, that's how we interpret that. All right, and it looks like it's a negative two, right? It looks like a negative slope. So we look at that, we go, okay, cool, all right? Now the difference here is because I'm dealing with a curve, the two, the X1 and the X2, those two points that I picked to plug in really makes a difference. So here's just a real quick, we're gonna do the same thing, kind of a little bit faster. I'm just gonna say, what if, x1 equals 0 and x2 equals 3. What if x1 equals 0 and x2 equals 3? And it, we're still dealing with the same function. f of x equals, sorry, x squared. All right, well, let's find it real quick. This won't take long, right? We'll do it really quickly. So when I put in f of x1, I'm going to put in a 0. What 0 squared? We already did it. 0. And when I put in x2, I'm going to find f of x2, that's plugging in a 3 here, 3 squared, what's that? 9, okay? So now I have two different values, right? I still have the 0, although if you noticed, I switched them, right? Earlier, the 0 was the x2, now I've got the 0 as x1, okay? So I've still got the 0, but I've got a 9. So let's look at that a rock real quickly. Remember, it's f of x2. Well, that was this guy, right? 9 minus f of x1. That was the 0 guy. Over my x2 guy. Oh, sorry. My x2 guy is a 3 minus my x1 guy was a 0. And I'm running through this pretty quickly just because I want you to see what's happening here. But if you're having problem, keep up with it, kind of pause the video, go do this math for yourself. Make sure you understand that in between these two points, my a rock is a three. Average rate of change. All right. So what does that mean? That means whenever I was over here, this point was still the same, right? Sticking right here. This point was still the same, but I've also got one, two, three, and nine somewhere up here, right? Or my second point. I plugged in a three, I got on a nine. Look at this guy. This secant line has a positive slope, right? And what we see from looking right here, interpret, okay, <laughs> the slope of this secant line 
is a m equals three slope average rate of change m equals three. So it depends where I pick my two points as to what the secant line would look like between those two points, right? And if I get these two points closer together, maybe you pick x1 as 2, x3, x2 is 3, and then you would see, oh, it's going to be an even steeper slope, but still positive. So that slope changes, the slope of the secant line changes depending on the two points you choose, okay? And that should hopefully make sense because what's going on here, I'm decreasing, 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 right? So those guys were negative slopes and now I'm increasing, increasing, increasing. So these guys, the secant lines have positive slopes. So this is not a constant slope for this curve because it's a curve, not a straight line. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. That also kind of ties in with the difference quotient that we saw, I think it was a section or two ago. Um, and it will tie in with some calculus as you head that direction. So for our purposes, we just need to really remember that the average rate of change or a rock, this guy, basically functions just like the slope function. We just have to know what we're putting in. All right, I hope that all makes sense, and I'll get this recording into your D2L, and we will go from there. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. Bye.